VIT kick-started a review of the Victorian Teaching Profession's Code of Conduct with a Professional Boundaries workshop in March, attended by over 100 representatives from the profession and a wide range of other key education stakeholder groups. The purpose of the workshop was to gather feedback on the strengths of the code and any opportunities for improvement. We have to go in there and conduct ourselves in a manner in which the community has uh, every confidence that um, our, our professional obligations will be met. Now, unless we have some sort of guiding practice or some set of guidelines, um, we will either be creeping in the dark or making mistakes. And when someone, unfortunately it happens, steps outside that expectation, uh, having something like the Code of Conduct means we can refer back to it and bring people back to account. Parents Victoria believe the Code of Conduct is critical and essential to our teaching profession. Um, they have a huge responsibility in their role to teach but also to role model um, and build confidence in our community um, that this is a very important part of the journey to the world of life. I'm a registered teacher myself and for me the idea of a code of conduct is something that sets the standard and um, helps me to know what it is that as a professional I'm required to uh, rise to in lots of ways. Um, it ensures that students and teachers can have um, good relationships which can enhance students learning without it going into um, inappropriate territory. And I think the code of conduct is really important because it outlines how teachers should act in terms of how they should behave in the classroom uh, objectively um, so that every student feels connected in the classroom and engaged in the classroom but also outside because that impacts what students think of the teachers as well. Specific case studies were examined to see how the code can be used to guide teacher conduct and help them understand appropriate professional boundaries because it's not just in the classroom, it's beyond the classroom as well. Um, in your professional capacity as a teacher, you are always every day role modelling in your community. And I think the discussions in the workshop are particularly about where are the lines in the sand? What are those professional boundaries? And everyone being mindful, not just the teacher, but the people, you're part of a community. So we had the principle 3.2, which talked about staff conduct, um, talks about negligence, mandatory reporting, privacy issues, um, and we were just talking about sometimes the wording could be a bit ambiguous, especially depending on people's values and how they uh, interpret that. So at my table we've been focusing on principle 1.3, which actually talks about teachers being uh, self-aware enough to know what they can and can't teach and when they're teaching well and when they should draw in the advice of other professionals. Um, a lot of our conversation has been centred on uh, the sorts of uh, grey areas where teachers might be asked to teach outside their area of expertise or their, their particular qualifications. And I think a code of conduct can speak to that very clearly and help teachers to discern when they need to put up their hand and say, I might need help with this. All right, so we were covering principle 1.5, which I believe is that um, relationships must be kept professional between students and or teachers and learners, was the word used, um, in, an, in the educational institution and also outside of that. Um, we were saying that there's like a lot of discrepancy with the word valid reason to touch the student. Um, so like in an educational setting could be like helping them with like instrument playing or sport. Um, but then if the student's upset was one of the issues we came up with then like is it okay to hug them? Um, especially if the student instigates that like then can the teacher get in trouble? Where would that go? Uh, so yeah, that was some of the issues we were talking about. The discussions on each table were lively and represented the views of a wide range of teaching contexts. Journalist and workshop facilitator Geraldine Doog said the workshop highlighted the vast range of ethical dilemmas that teachers face each day and the complexity of the expectations placed on them in the modern teaching world. The key discussion that we had was around whether well, the principal had a few different points. 
um, one of them was that teachers should act in the best interest of students, but it was also that um, what teachers do has to be impartial and free from bias for every student so that students feel equally treated. And we had a few different discussions and I guess dilemmas in that discussion as in sometimes teachers may need to do things that are in the best interest of students but that might also be in conflict with being impartial to all students. So that was, so that was something that we discussed and I felt that well, it kind of correlated with a lot with my experience as in um, some teachers might be um, might be closer with some students because of uh, past experiences, because they because of their community involvement, because of involvement in extracurricular activities, or some student, uh, some teachers might be do, doing special things for certain students because of their special needs. And I thought the uh, discussion there was really interesting. I also know that as a past uh, member of council, we had a lot of dilemmas around uh, the health of, of teachers and their fitness to teach as well. So principle 1.3 deals with that. And uh, it, we've had a lot of conversations about when is it that teachers should declare that they might not be able to manage their teaching um, for this period of time. So that's quite a dilemma for us to consider. Now I teach in a classroom where every child in front of me has access to technology way beyond that experience I had when I graduated. The code was written a long time ago in comparison to what where technology is today and where society is today because of that technology. And so we constantly have to update. We're just like every other profession, we need to update, we need to remain uh, current. Uh, and, and if we don't, then we fall behind and we let children down. Um, in what situation is appropriate for a teacher to attend an event outside of school that's not school related um, with students, especially in like a rural setting, um, where everyone kind of knows each other, they're all like in the same football club and um, like if students of age, like 18 years, and um, they like play football and then the teacher like coaches them and then they go to the um, pub to like have a celebratory drink or whatever, um, is that appropriate? And um, also in that situation, um, if the teacher and the students were under influence um, and then they like touch each other, is that um, appropriate? and how would that be controlled. There's an important shared responsibility between uh, the learning setting, the employer, and the, uh, the teacher in this whole area of the code because there need to be supports and checks and balances in place uh, that enable a teacher who might not be up to scratch for that particular context to be supported in that but also uh, that somebody who says or puts themselves forward as an expert is actually monitored uh, for the sake of our kids. I think the opportunities are about how employers and the regulators work together in supporting staff about doing their best in keeping in compliance with the code, but always retaining a human element about how to support them in that role. If we want to improve our code of conduct as a profession, I think that it needs to deal with some of the, the new complexities of our social context and uh, the expectations that community has around how teachers will be when they work within the profession. That might mean some changes that take account of um, social media, and the way teachers might or might not interact with students in that way. During the morning tea session, I was just going around looking at the different brainstorming that was put up. And one of the suggestions was that there would be complementary documents, supporting documents for the code of conduct um, to outline more specific examples. And I thought that was really great because a lot of the discussion that was going on on our table was that while the code of conduct, a lot of it was good in terms of principles and in terms of the ideas of it. It was vague on a specific circumstances and how different uh, principles would conflict with each other. And I thought the idea of having that supporting document would be really great. Um, I think there needs to be more transparency um, for students to also know about the code. I guess with the code of conduct, the idea behind most of the principles are pretty clear. It's just probably the um, wording and the interpretation that can be taken from other people as to how 
they incorporate that into their teaching? It's important, I think, for me as a teacher, but also for the teachers that I work with, that they understand uh, what our community expects of teachers and what teachers themselves expect of each other within the profession. Feedback from the workshop will inform a discussion paper seeking further submissions and feedback on the code.